Well, our next speaker is uh, getting ready. Mic'd up. Um, please let me introduce you uh, Bon Verwey. He's going to talk about um, um, uh, being a neurosurgeon and working with 3D copies, 3D models of the area he's going to operate upon. He brought a sample. He brought an, he brought an actual copy of a skull. So please join us at the innovation stage for our next speaker talking about 3D printing and how this is uh, affecting neurosurgery, uh, to be precise. There's still some room. Of Meanwhile, for the people who are seated um, here at the innovation stage, please find our little power banks. They will charge your smartphone for an entire, uh, yes, those are those white little thingies. And you can charge your phone with it will load it up for an entire, um, how do you call it? Charge? Yeah? Something like that. It's a present from CGI. So please, so please find it. While we are getting ready for our next speaker, talking about uh, neuro neurosurgeons and how they use 3D printing to get an exact copy of a skull and how this really helps, enables them to make lesser mistakes be more accurate, know where, what to work with in, uh, in what area. Bon Verwey is uh, actually the first surgeon who has been successful in applying 3D play printing while operating on a patient. Are you ready? Then we'll open up the mic. So please join us at the innovation stage. We'll start in a minute. Find your seats. If 3D printing and or neurosurgery applies to you or appeals to you, please join us at the innovation stage. You're already smiling. Why is that? Because neurosurgery applies not to me uh, and that's, uh, I think, a happy thing. Uh. <laughs> luckily so. For most of us, yes, luckily so that we are, it doesn't apply to us, but maybe it's a field of interest. Maybe appealing. We can um, have a little view of the, the documents inside. There's still some seats available here at the innovation stage. Please join us. 3D printing is... Um, is, is, is entering the field of neuro neurosurgery. Yes, we get some audio in place. Oh my goodness, it's for, it's for the tough stomach, I presume. Isn't it? There it is, there it is. Okay, please, um, your attention for uh, Bon Verwey. Yeah. Okay, it works. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, well, thank you very much for the invitation. Uh, if you have any questions, please uh, feel free to ask directly. Um, what I'm going to say a little bit is uh, every brain surgery, you start with opening the skull. And uh, usually uh, we put the bone flap back, but in some cases um, the bone flap will get infected. So we have to take it out. And you will have a, l a huge gap actually in the skull. Well. What do we do about it? Um, well, I'll bring you back to 50 years ago when I was in Peru and I was taking a picture of this skull, which was not allowed actually, but of course I want to do that. And what you see here is a piece of gold and it's part of the skull. It means that these patients did survive the surgery, which is quite amazing in that time because the, uh, the death rate of surgery 100 years ago of brain surgery was almost 95% because of infection. Well. Uh, what did I do 15 years ago or 10 years ago when I had a gap uh, in the skull? We used the paste. It was acryl plastic and you could, uh, you could form it within 10 minutes. It would be um, uh, hard actually. So you have to make it in a perfect fit within 10 minutes. Now if you look at larger defects like this patient which was referred to me, um, then it's quite difficult to make a perfect fit of a skull. And in this case, it's going to the outward, outward side, 
but in some cases it's pushed backwards against the brain and you will have deficits. So at that time I thought there should be a better way of doing this and one of the I think major uh, things with innovation is if you have that idea look at the internet and instead of trying to invent the wheel yourself try to find um, a place in the world where they do this and try to work together and actually after quite a long search um, uh, I found uh, in Australia a company who was developing this technique so we start working together so what, do, what did we do well what you do is you make a CT scan of the skull of a patient and then you will see the deficit uh, the deficit is uh, transferred to a computer and there we make a perfect fit and that fit is sent to or a printer or just a way of shaping and then you will have a perfect implant and we just ship them uh, from Australia to Utrecht we sterilize them and here you can see it you can print it or what you sometimes do is to print a scaffold and to to shape the, the implant over that layer of uh, printing. So what we used in the past was titanium because titanium you can print very well. Um, but the problem is that if you're in a cold area, people have a lot of headache. And uh, so we actually we got some patients who we replaced the titanium with plastic. So these days I only use plastic actually. It's very strong and there's no rejection in the, in the body actually. Actually we see that there's less infection with implants of plastic than by implanting your own skull back. And definitely with the, uh, when you build it by hand because it takes a long time to do that. Um, this is also a kind of a material where the bone will grow into it, but I don't think there's any advantage of it actually. There are a lot of companies try to advocate it's better, but I don't think you really care when it's, when it's fixed and when it doesn't reject, you can't see it anyway, so why bother with it? Um, I, I will give you a few examples. This is a young woman and she was hit by a bus. She was deeply comatose. I was on call and she had a, bleed, a big bleeding in the brain. Um, so I took the, opened the skull, took the bleeding out. She woke up completely fine uh, after, actually after a week. And then we re-implanted because the, the brain will swell. So we have to make a big hole. So there's a lot of space for the brain to swell and, and that way you won't die. And later we put the, the bone flap back, but then it got slowly resorbed. And because of the resorption, she, she ended up with a big uh, hole in her head. And then again, well, if you would make it by hand, you saw the previous uh, picture, there's a very high, high chance that she will have a deformity of the skull. Um, so what we did, we had a perfect scan. We uh, sent it to Australia. There they made it on a computer a perfect fit. And this is the result. You won't see actually that there has been a replacement of the skull. Now, all these patients, I was allowed to use their picture, but they, they definitely did not want me to put a, one of those uh, things over their eyes because they said they didn't want to look like a criminal. So that's why you can recognize these patients, but they're completely fine with it. Um, this was a more complicated. In this case, we don't this be done in all major hospitals now. Uh, this was a more complex case. It was also a military police. He was in Germany, he was hit by a bus, also a bus, and his, he got extreme brain swelling and he would die. So what they did there was to open the skull on two sides so his brain could swell and that's why he survived. Then they later, weeks later or months later, they put the bone flaps back and they got infected. So they had to take it out again. And that's how he walked around in Utrecht for, I knew him because it's quite an obvious way someone looks like. And um, he, um, he came to me because he heard that I was doing these kind of surgeries. Well, there are a few problems in this case because the skin is very elastic. And when it's not round but straight, there's less skin. So you need to, in some way, to have extra skin and you have to have a replacement of the, the bone. And here you see what well, the first thing we did was to make a CT scan and have a completely uh, copy of it and send it to the, to the friends in Australia and they reconstructed the skull. And the second thing I had to do, and um, here is the, the, I have to put a balloon under the skin 
and we had to inflate it within a few months, so there was more and more skin. So we had enough skin to close it. And this picture, I made it black and white, because I don't know if people really can handle the blood. So that's why I changed it into a black and white picture. Here you see the implants of the skull in plastic in exactly the right shape. So now we have the perfect fit, and we have enough skin. And this is the result. A total rebuild of the skull, actually. This is another patient. He was a guy who had a brain tumor. He was operated somewhere, and um, uh, the tumor was taken out, and he got inf the skull got infected, so they had to take it out also. And he had radiation, so his skin was very vulnerable. And he walked around like this. Well, not this, this is another balloon which we, we brought in. But he walked around like this, and he was told that he had to live with it. Well, you have to imagine what it means to people when you have a benign tumor, it's taken out, you have a normal lifespan, and you have to walk around like this. That's terrible. So he came to our center, and the first thing we did was implant a balloon in a different, different surgery. You have to inflate it by water for a few months, so he had extra skin, and that's how he ended later on the operating table. And then we reconstructed the whole skull in a computer program. And this is the result. So a total rebuild of a skull, actually. And this is exactly, I saw the pictures, and we looked at the same pictures of the patient before the surgery. So I had an idea how he looked. And that's how we rebuilt it on the computer uh, on model. Um, this is a total, totally different patient. Um, she came in, it was a 22-year-old a woman, and what she had was a disease. And the disease, and here you see a normal scan of a patient. This is the front, this is the back of the head, and this is her scan. You see an enormous amount of, of growing of the skull. And it's a disease where we usually start growing up till the age of 30. And what happens is because of the enormous growth of the skull, there's a lot of pressure on the brain. And when you have high brain pressure, you will first get a headache, then you get nauseated, you will throw up. And then the extreme amount of pressure during all those years pushed a lot of fluid into her optic nerve, the nerve which you use to see. So she got blind. The next step, and what you can see here is an MRI scan. This is her brain, this is the enormous thick skull, and this is their, her, small, her small brain. And the only hole you have in your skull is actually where your brain stem and your spine will get into your, your, your skull. So everything was pushed out towards this opening. Well, what you have then is that your small brain is not functioning anymore. Well, what's the best example of a non-functioning small brain? It's when you're drunk. When you're drunk, your small brain does not work. Well, do, what does your small brain do? Your small brain does coordinate every movement you have. Because if I want to move my right hand, I think about it in front of my brain. There's a signal sent to my motor cortex on the left side of my brain. Then there goes a signal out throughout my brain who wants to use my right hand. But if that would be only the way to react, it would be a movement like this. Then it was sent to my small brain, and there's the fine-tuning of every movement. Well, if that doesn't work, you cannot fine-tune everything. You will get sloppy. You cannot walk over a straight line. You will fall. And your tongue, which is a very precise instrument, will not work properly, so people who are drunk are just talking like this. So that's why your small brain, that's what your small brain does, actually. So she had all those symptoms. And she lived, actually, with the idea that she would die one day. Her family knew that because there was no solution to this. Because what you can do is open the skull, and then it will grow back quite rapidly. So she came into, was sent to me and with the idea that I was replacing parts of the skull. And I thought, well, why not replace a whole skull? Is that possible? Well, I didn't know either if that was possible. Um, because there are a few problems. There are four blood vessels going into your brain and there's one going out. And that's going in, in the middle here. And it's part of your meninges, which is the, the, the cover over your brain. 
And when you sever this, when it, when it opens, you'll die. There's no way you can survive. It's a huge bleeding, and within a few minutes, you have your whole blood volume will be lost. So what I had to do, I thought I w if I could open the skull on two sides and leave the, the middle part, uh, re keep it remained, and then cut it in the front and cut it in the back and then lift it, I thought that would be the possibility to do it. But there are a few other tricks I had to do in order to make this work. And, um, and then I thought, well, then reproduce on the computer a new skull um, on two, two halves of it, actually, and then replace it. I mean, that was the plan. So I talked to my colleagues and said, well, what do you think? Is there any reason, well, not reason not to do it because otherwise you would die? He said, well, I think this could work. I had to make holes in it because there has to be an exchange of the new brain. It has to expand. It will take a while. And there's a lot of fluid around it. And it has to be taken up by the skin. That's what the only way I thought that she would survive. And that's actually how it worked. Um, that's how I started surgery. Don't worry if I give a talk to medical people. I have a lot of other pictures, so I didn't put it in here. Um, so I started the surgery. That's our navigation system. This is a satellite, actually. And so we can see exactly where we are uh, in the scan. So we know exactly where the, the piece of the skull are and what we take out. Uh, I had to open it, of course. I had to take the skin out this way and the other way. So I had the whole skull exposed. And then this was the replacement of the skull. Uh, which was ready, and so it. Um, this is the final results. The only picture with a little blood in it. You'll see here her nose. These are the feet. She is laying like on her back, and this is the whole top of the skull. This is how you look at her patient, and this is the front. This is the, the remnant I left, and this is the whole skull. It's you actually can see through it, and this is the brain which is underneath it. So I replaced the whole skull by a new skull. This is the surgery. These are other cases like a heart transplantation, all kinds of other surgery. And this is where I started at 8 in the morning. And the next day at 8 or 9, I was ready after 24 hours because it took a long time to take the skull off. It was very hard. So I had to use a lot of drill systems. And uh, it was quite complicated to do so, actually. Um, and this is the final result. This is a scan after surgery. You see here in, in orange, that's the new skull, and uh, this is the old part. And actually, this patient, and you see here also the, the old uh, uh, pressure on the brain here. And you see here that, you see here there's the level. You see here the small brain is pushed downwards. And here it's, it's completely re, uh, has a normal position again. And actually, we made a scan just two weeks ago, and it's even more up. And she's completely fine, has no deficit, she's functioning, back to work, and she has a normal life expectancy again. So that's all possible because of 3D printing and reconstruction on a computer. This surgery would not have been possible, I think, two or three years ago. Because there's no way that she would be able to make it by hand and reconstruct from a paste, which will harden out in 10, 15 minutes to get a completely normal skull. And uh, even if you will see, well, in, in my hair, you will see exactly every detail of a skull. But even you will not be able to completely have it the, the right shape. And it will be probably pushed on the, on the brain. So it's quite risky to do it that way. So it's, she's completely fine now. Um, shortly about 3D printing, well, there are a lot of stuff we can use these days. Jaws are implanted. Um, then there's, uh, it, it looks like everybody is doing something for the first time. We were the first with the, the skull, and there are people with vertebrae, which are printed. Um, shoulder blades actually completely implanted by 3D printing. Um, and knees. Well, uh, what people often ask was, there's also something like tissue printing. It's not normal material, plastic or metal, but tissue printing. And is there space for tissue printing, actually? Well, I think there is. Um, if you look at, uh, for example, uh, livers, well, you cannot replace it. There's no machine which can replace a liver. Well, I don't say that tissue printing is that far that we can place organs, although a kidney has been printed from living cells, but you cannot keep it alive long enough to use it into a person. But maybe one day it will be that far, but at this moment you can print skin, 
it's no problem and you just replace it uh, that will work well well why is it important look at knees joints if you have a, a knee and you have to replace it there are a lot of people with total prosthesis then at some point in life you need a revision of that knee uh, because it, there's a lot of uh, damage on these uh, implants well human tissue has something very adventurous and which is that it can re um, repair itself so the thing is that right now in Utrecht it's not my field it's orthopedics what they do now is to print cartilage of human cells which is possible so you print it and replace it into a knee for example and that knee can repair itself throughout your life so there's a lot of space for 3D printing of tissue which has a lot of advantage over other materials okay well so far all the success stories and if you think that neurosurgery is a success story well uh, believe me sometimes a lot of uh, disastrous cases uh, this was a woman 30 years old she's a musician and she had a brain aneurysm and what you see here is the front of the skull is the back here and just a, one of the cut through the head and she has an aneurysm and an aneurysm is a a uh, weak part of an artery in the brain and it bulges out and it becomes this aneurysm but the chance it will burst when you have this age and this size of aneurysm extremely high it's almost 30 40 percent within the next couple of years so then what you need you can do is discuss it with the patient and have it repaired and the only way to repair this was doing the surgery well it means that this surgery is quite tricky um, and what you need to do is to have to, to cut the aneurysm and close it but make sure that the other vessels remain patent because these small vessels those two they go to the front of your brain if you cut it or you close those vessels you live like a vegetable because you cannot think anymore you don't have any any uh, thoughts you don't have your intelligence you will have nothing except only your movements only those very small two vessels uh, this makes uh, makes us actually human this part of the brain that's why we're human and those two small vessels that's what they, they supply them with oxygen so how to to operate this well you have to find a way to approach it you have to put a clip here and to make sure that these vessels remain patent so what I do is I build this two-dimensional model into a three-dimensional model in my own brain and with that knowledge and experience I try to find an approach to or into the head should I go from the left side from the middle or from the right side in what way do I enter these blood vessels um, well I was I was doing the surgery I discussed it with her and there are books written about which approach to take well taking that in account with the experience I went to the, opened the skull, went to the brain, found the blood vessels, entered the aneurysm, and at that time I realized that I did not have the perfect overview. I thought I would have a perfect overview of the, the base of the aneurysm, but there was a lot of calcification in the, in the wall of the aneurysm. Um, and at that moment that I entered the aneurysm, and I thought, well, I'd better go from the other side, which is a huge undertaking. We have to start surgery again. It blew because there was no pressure against the aneurysm anymore so it popped and there was a huge arterial bleeding well of course you have to stop that huh? and um, five minutes. And uh, the only way to do that is uh, by clipping the arteries here and then you have 10 minutes to solve the problem well I was able to do that so I clipped the aneurysm stopped the bleeding and I thought everything was okay but she woke up with a huge stroke she couldn't understand language anymore her personality has changed and she has a paresis of her leg and luckily within the next weeks and months it recovered quite well but not completely but she has a good quality of life and um, at that moment um, it's a devastating thing for a patient it's devastating for the family and it's devastating for the surgeon because it's every time the risk you take and it happens not only in our hospital but in every city in every state, in every country, 
in every continent, all over the world, every day. And it's not because we don't do the things right, but it's simply the risk of the things. And nine out of 10 will go well, but sometimes it doesn't go well. And you have to realize that in order to improve and use innovation to change it. So the question I ask myself is, if we could only do this again, if I could do it again, but of course you cannot, but now we can actually. What we did is have a 3D print, and this is a patient we're going to operate in the near future. This is an exact copy of a patient. Exact this aneurysm, and exactly at the same spot. And here you can see it. This is the a, a, a copy of the, the, the patient. And now I can see if I enter from this side or from the other side, if I can enter the aneurysm well enough. So in this way, you can really try the surgery before you do it in a patient. And if I would have had this in this patient, which I just uh, discussed, then I would have seen it was impossible to go from the right side. Even if that's the normal side, in normal cases, I would have done it differently. So using this, and it's another picture of the patient, is really helping us in order to improve surgery. This is another uh, few minutes of patient which I didn't operate. It's a Siamese, uh, twin, identical twin. You have to build up the picture in your own head and to figure out how to operate. It's quite complicated. Well, you can do make another picture, a nicer scan, and try to figure out in your head how to do it. Or maybe an even nicer scan, but it's still difficult to do. Well, what you really need is a 3D print and have it your end. As surgeon, we want to have stuff in our hands. We want to practice it and we want to operate it and do it again. If it doesn't work out, print it again, operate again, print it again, operate again. Up till the moment, it's completely going well. And at that moment, you can say, okay, now I'm going to operate the patient. The last thing I want to show is the next step is virtual reality. And uh, I discussed this with Microsoft. This is uh, the HoloLens, but there are different ways than virtual reality where you can really practice your surgery. Because you want to keep it, see from which direction to enter the patient. And what you do is not a regular patient, but the patient you're all going to operate tomorrow is the patient you're going to scan. And this is the heart of the patient, of course, not only nurse surgery, it's the heart of the patient you're going to operate, or the brain, or the knee, or whatever. And from that moment on, you can really see in detail how you're going to approach it. I think that's the other next step, and I'm working on it quite a lot now, to see if we can use that in our daily practice and really uh, operate tomorrow's patient with the knowledge we have today and the practice. And even residents who are in training, they can practice on these patients because one of the, the hardest things to do is to teach it to other people, especially those aneurysms, which are very tricky surgery. Uh, it's hard to give it out of your hands and have a resident do it because they can make one mistake and then there will be a paralysis or a stroke. And in this way, we can really have the residents train the surgery and say, do it again and again and again and again. And when I see they're going to do it well, then I say, okay, now tomorrow you can do the surgery with, of course, me next to it. Um, this is the way we are going to operate in the near future, I think, with a lot of uh, helmets project everything, we can see through the brain, see where the vessels are, which are tricky in surgery. Right now I have to uh, reconstruct it in my own brain and find out, I think, the vessels are behind the brain and I have to be careful not to hit those vessels uh, in order to damage them. But now I can see straight through the brain and see exactly where they are. Um, I think that's the new way of doing surgery. Thank you. Thank you very much. That's, that's really innovation that, um, well, contributes on so many levels. So thank you so much. Unfortunately, we do not have time for Q&A. Will you be available at the Speakers Cafe to, uh, well, do yeah, maybe one-on-one uh, -on -one questions right. yeah. uh, with the audience? Yeah. I'm sure there are many. Um, my question would be, um, are there people working with you now? Because, well, you entered the whole 3D printing into neurosurgery, didn't you? Yes, I did. But... Um, well, what I would, uh, and these are meetings are perfect. If there are anybody who wants to really to work on it for, for a few months or longer, uh, students or companies and want to put a lot of effort in it, that's, that's the kind of people we need actually to work together with. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much. Thanks okay. again. Thank you.